So here's the assumption that I'm going to make, is that you all basically have a knowledge of Kim 1, and stoichiometry, and the elements, and balancing equations, and maybe a little bit of molarity. Okay, that's the assumption that I'm going to go off of, okay? And I think that's going to be pretty valid, all right? So, here's how this is going to play out. So, obviously, you guys are here today, and for those of you that take and Isaiah, so here, here's your option on, like, tomorrow. You can either, you should have all gotten, like, an invitation through to join the Zoom, so there's going to be a daily Zoom. So on your off days, or if you're sick or gone, you can either zoom in and watch it live, or I'm going to record each, each day's lesson and dump it out on YouTube, and then I'll send you out the link to that YouTube. So, but now, I say that, but like tomorrow is that I'm going to, because I want that first day to kind of get everybody going, and I don't want that to be like a YouTube thing, unless you are gone, because if you have some kids that are going to be completely gone. But tomorrow, you guys, I'm going to be doing the same thing tomorrow with them. So you guys don't have to worry about anything tomorrow. On Wednesday, I'm going to dump out a video where I kind of discuss a lot of the things that are going to be on this review assignment that I'm giving you today. So I won't have a Zoom. That's just going to be a YouTube video that I'm going to make. Now, if, and here's what I beg of you. I guarantee you, if you don't know how to do a problem, there's 19 of you in this class. I guarantee you, there's probably 12, a minimum of 12 other people that also don't know how to do that problem. Okay? So if you don't know how to do the problem, email me, join the chat in Zoom, whatever. Say, hey, Burkamp, I don't know how to do this problem. Because I promise you, you're not the only one. Okay? Because there, there's just such disparity between when you've had chemistry and what you've had in chemistry and everything else. So do not sit there and go, wow, I was the only one that didn't, that didn't remember this, or I was the only one that didn't know how to do this. I promise you, okay, I promise you, you are not going to be alone on that boat, okay? So don't sink alone. Don't be afraid to say, hey, this is what, this is what we got going. Uh, so today, uh, I'm going to kind of do some preliminary work. I've got textbooks, okay? So you, for those of you that are in AP Physics, you're going to have another book to drag around with you. Okay. Uh, so you can have that. And then just a bunch of documents. Uh, so let me go in the back, grab some of those, so that then I can explain to everybody that's wanting to watch the YouTube video. So give me a second. Let me go get all those documents. Well, we'll get a poetry textbook. Yeah. And poetry. I hate poetry. That's a burning passion. Poetry's dog. I used to hate poetry. I like the movie Dead Poets Society. I don't like poetry. I'd rather read poetry than read like books. You're crazy. I would rather read nonfiction than either. Just watch the movie, bro. <laughs> I just stared at the wall. No, you already know how to do this cam scan and get yourself. Yep. Okay. Oh, I know how to do this cam scan. Okay. Uh, so let me let me explain all the paperwork that you're gonna pick up. So first one is solubility rules, okay? So certain compounds, when you mix them together, are soluble or insoluble in water. Basically, it boils down to a tug of war. So you're not going to have to memorize these, but you're going to at least have to know like a working knowledge of them. Like if you look on your periodic table, quick refresher. So you have the group one elements, okay? Lithium, sodium, potassium, okay? Those ones, your alkali metals. All of those are soluble in water. Salt, for example, sodium chloride is soluble in water. So basically what that means is that when you have a sodium chloride crystal, which is, that remember, the sodium is positively charged, the chlorine is negatively charged, and you put that in the presence of a water molecule, so here's oxygen, and we'll go through a whole bunch of this. Don't, don't, don't flip out and go, my God, I've never heard any of this before. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about it. Don't flip out. 
But the oxygen molecule has this dome of negativity. Okay, it has two unbound pairs of electrons. So that's the negative region of the water molecule. The hydrogen end is positively charged. So water is said to have what we call a dipole moment. It has a negatively charged end and a positively charged end. So this is like a tug of war. So when you put sodium chloride, otherwise known as salt, in water, here is the tug of war that exists. The sodium obviously is bound to the chlorine. That's what makes it salt. Okay? It's a solid. If the sodium and chlorine weren't bound to each other, guess what? You wouldn't have salt. So you put the salt in, in the water. And so the chlorine is negatively charged, so it's attracted to the positive end of the water molecule. And the sodium is bound to, it's going to be attracted to the negative end because they have opposite charges. So basically, if something is soluble in water, that just means it dissolves. So the attraction between the sodium and the oxygen is enough to break this apart. So this bond is stronger with, with, these pol with this polar molecule than it is with each other. That's why it dissolves. Now, if this didn't happen, salt would be insoluble in water. Okay? Like you all are insoluble in water. Tate swims a lot. When Tate jumps into the pool, I don't have to worry about Tate dissolving in water, okay? This would be awkward. It's like, what happened to Tate? I don't know, okay? He jumped in and now he's soluble, okay? Well, let's heat up the pool and we'll evaporate off the water and see if we can get Tate back, okay? It's like, really, really awkward. So you all are insoluble in water. So what that means is that when you jump in water, the molecule, the strength that holds you all together is stronger than the attraction is for the water. You don't have to worry about this all. So you're going to need that because we're going to be talking about like double displacement reactions. Okay? And so here are the solubility rules down here. Okay? We've also got a list of strong acids and weak acids, which we'll talk about later. Uh, and then don't worry about what's on the back of the sheet. We'll talk about that later. So the blue sheet is going to be, this is the periodic table that you will always have available to you on the test. Now, with this particular periodic table, notice that the names of the elements aren't on here, okay? The only thing you have are the symbols. So you just have to know, oh, nitrogen is N, oxygen is O, okay? So on the test or a quiz, this is the periodic table that you will have. I will give you a laminated version of this for any quiz or test or anything like that. And by the way, the first one is going to be a week from, your first quiz is going to be a week from today. Not a full-blown test, just a quiz. And so for those of you that have had me for physics, this is different because I, ne I never gave you quizzes in physics, but I give you quizzes in chemistry, especially in this first unit because this first unit on acid base equilibrium is going to take us about three weeks to get through, and I don't want to wait until the bitter end to just give you one big test. So we're actually going to have like three quizzes as we go along and have one big test at the end. So that's going to be a little bit different than what you all are used to for the release of you that have me for physics. On the back side of this is a standard reduction table. Okay, it has to do with redox reactions. Don't worry about this for now. This will become your friend later on. Okay, so what you need to worry about now is this. The green sheet you will have, and this is a list of the equations that you will have on the actual AP exam, for those of you who are going to take the AP exam. And this is also what you're going to have for any quiz or test on here. So for now, the only thing that you all need to worry about for now is uh, this section right here where it talks about pH and Ka and Kb and Kw. So initially, this little bit of this green side right here, this is the only thing we're going to worry about. Eventually, we will get through every equation that's on here. Okay? So, but initially, you only have to worry about equilibrium and this little section about Ka, Kb, pH, and that type of thing. So you'd have that. This is kind of a cheat sheet. So this lists your kind of strong acids, weak acid, weak bases, strong bases, just some names of some common compounds that you see a lot in chemistry. 
like methane, benzene, chloroform, that type of thing. So that is just kind of a little reference sheet. You don't have to worry about memorizing all of this. Uh, it used to be on the AP exam, and they've changed this, thank God, because uh, it used to be where they would have like a bunch of equations, and you would have to know, like, you'd have to memorize the chloroform of CHCl3. So if you didn't, if you had memorized the formula for chloroform, then you couldn't balance the equation. So they've, they've done away with that part of it, but this is just a handy dandy little reference sheet. It's got a lot of the common anions, okay, your acetates, that type of thing, uh, your common cations, okay. So this is just a little reference sheet. You will not have access to this on the test, but if it's anything hinky, like really weird, I'll give you the formula for it. Okay, so don't, again, don't sit there and memorize this. You'll have this. Uh, this sheet, this side, uh, Announcing Advanced Placement Chemistry 2021, this basically says this is the expectations that I'm going to have of you. It's a college-level chemistry class. You know, you all are successful academically, and this is kind of what we're going to, what we're going to do uh, and how I, it's up to me to basically challenge all of you because I could make this a really, really easy class, but then that wouldn't do you any, wouldn't do you well later on. And then the back side, these are just the four big uh, topics that we're going to cover. Some people like to know, hey, what are we going to cover this year? So th those are the big items. So there are other ones, but that's, that's the big one. And then you've got uh, the textbook. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to call you back. That way you can get your textbook, and then just basically it's going to be in the simple line. Just walk along and pick up this. The last thing that you're going to pick up, and I didn't staple this together because of uh, because you're going to be taking cam scan or pictures of it anyway, but this is like a two-page review, and this is what we're going to start to work through today. So uh, for those of you that, uh, Isaiah, have you ever used cam scanner? Yeah. Okay. Here's the main thing when you send me stuff, is that you have to put like, for example, if you know you're going to go hail three, and then leave a space, and then whatever the name of this is. So like, up here in the top corner, I've got AP Chem, and then this is what I want called. So you would go like hail three, review, because that way, when I look at it, when you send it to me as an attachment or as a PDF file, I know it's coming from NOAA, I know that it's third block, and then I know what it is. So, now, here's the one thing I'm going to tell you. And keep in mind, this semester is, is going to be brutal for me. Because I go honors, physics, first block, this class, and then AP Physics. So I've got three different preps, all three college level classes, okay? I'm, just, I'm not begging for sympathy, but I'm just telling you. I am not, time for me is going to be exceedingly precious. So when you take a picture of that cam scanner, so help me God, you make sure that it's in focus and you make sure that you have every page on there and that page is in focus because I am not gonna send it back to you and go, Hey, you know, Ryan, you forgot the third page. I swear to you, I am going to grade whatever you send me, okay? This is your responsibility. You all are big people. You look at that document before you send it, and you double check that it has everything on it that you want to send me. And let me give you a hint. If it's out of focus and you can't read it, it doesn't get any better when, it, when I get to it, okay? So if your 18-year-old eyes struggle to see it, these 54-year-old eyes, after a long day of teaching at 10 o'clock at night, if it's blurry and I can't read it, love y'all to death, I'm not going to waste my time. Okay? So if you want to see what papers should look like, go to Amanda. Okay? Her papers are really, really easy to grade. She writes dark. They're always in focus. You need to work a little bit better on writing neatly. Okay? So, that's what I'm telling you. I love you all to death, and I want you all to be successful, but I am, I, this is just a survival thing for me. I am not going to waste my time trying to guess through what you have written, or if you're missing a page, I'm sorry, 
if those points are gone. You all are big people. You look at that document before you send it. Okay? And if it's not all there, don't send it. Okay, I know that's a radical concept. Okay? But here's the biggest thing. When you send it, and you don't have to, you won't have to send anything until this first assignment, which isn't due until Thursday. But I'm just giving you the hoorah speech right now. You look at that document and you make sure that if there is something on there that you can't read, guess what? I'm not going to be able to read it either. Okay? So I just don't want you to go through all this effort on these problems and then send it to me and go, oh, well, wow, Burkamp can't read it. I guess I should have written darker or something like that, or I should have included that page. So look at that document before you send it. Okay, so let me call you back, and I will get you and grab your book and those papers. <sighs> Okay, so let's kind of start off at the beginning. So the cool, so here's here's the dichotomy about me teaching chemistry is that we're going to spend a lot of time talking about chemical reactions and electrons, protons, and neutrons, and all this good stuff. But I can't ever show you what is actually happening, okay? And that's just the cold hard reality of it because we can't see an, elect an individual electron. We can kind of get a fuzzy image of like an individual atom if we isolate it, but so here's the first thing that you have to get out of your mind is the idea that you can apply a macroscopic view of the world to what's happening on an atomic level, okay? Just get over it, you can't. We have some beautiful mathematical models, okay, like Schrodinger's equations, which describe the probability of electron functions. We know the periodic table works. We know that these are going to have certain trends. But to try and visualize this in terms of, oh, here's an electron from here, and it's going over there, doesn't work. So it works beautifully. We can do some really cool things with it but I can never show you what is actually taking place. So what we have to do is we have to find different ways to figure that out. So I'm going to take a beaker, all right? And I'm just going to pour in a little bit of water here. Okay, not a big deal. So one of my favorite indicators is a substance called, as I say that, why do I not have phenolphthalein? There's my phenolphthalein. Okay, so phenolphthalein is cool because if I take this, and I'll put some in the test tube first. So I'll take some uh, sodium hydroxide, okay? So anybody remember right offhand the formula for sodium hydroxide? Sodium is Na, right? And you have hydroxide, which is OH. So this is one molar sodium hydroxide. So when we get into lab, each of you are going to have like a tra at a lab station, you're going to have a tray like this, and it's going to have some very commonly used chemicals. And one of them is one molar sodium hydroxide. So let's start at the beginning. So you have one molar sodium hydroxide. So what does that capital M stand for? What does molar mean? What does molarity mean? Moles per liter. Moles per liter, okay? So molarity is moles per liter. So what that means is if I have one liter of this substance, within that I have one mole of sodium hydroxide. Okay? Now let's even go back even further. So if I asked Tate to measure out one mole of sodium hydroxide, okay? Now remember, your scales don't measure in moles. Your scale is only measuring grams. So if you have one mole of anything, remember that's the relative atomic mass, okay, which is shown on your periodic table. Remember, the relative atomic mass is based upon carbon. They said, okay, here's carbon 12. That's our benchmark. So they, when you look at how the, if you, if you look at the history of the periodic table, 
Periodic table was initially laid out by relative atomic mass because when Mendeleev was doing that work, you didn't have any knowledge of protons, electrons, or neutrons. So even if, here's a uh, physics book, no, this isn't mine, but this is from 1902. Okay, and the same thing would be a chemistry book. If you look in the index in the back, there is no mentions of electrons, protons, or neutrons. We didn't know those subatomic particles existed until around the 1920s. So, if you look at sodium, so rel sodium has a relative atomic, so if you find sodium, right? So here you have that symbol, Na, right? So what's the relative atomic mass of sodium? 23, if I remember right? Okay. And then it's got an atomic number of 11. So that atomic number is the number of protons. Relative atomic mass is 23. So what that means is that a sodium atom having a relative atomic mass of 23 is about twice as massive as a carbon atom which has a relative value of 12. Okay. So that's all that means. So what they did is they said, okay, if you look at the history of how relative atomic mass transitioned into moles, they said, okay, look, we can't measure out an individual atom of sodium. Okay, you can't do it. But we're going to measure out large quantities of this. They said, okay, well, let's make it a mole. Okay? And then they said, all right, we're going to take that relative atomic mass, which was 23. So that's what you have to remember. Relative atomic masses were established first, and that's how they arranged that's how they arranged the periodic table. Increasing relative atomic mass, but they also stacked them in columns based upon their based upon their properties. Okay? So they said, okay, here's lithium, sodium, potassium. Okay, those were stacked in the same column because they had similar properties. And then you worked your way across. Okay? So the metals tend to be, if you look on the, the vast majority of your periodic table is metals. There's actually very few non-metals. Most of the periodic table is classified as metals and they're solids. You have your non-metals, which are on the far right side, and then you have, and the most, those are going to be like your halogens, like chlorine, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Okay? And then you have your noble gases, and remember the noble gases don't react with anything because they have a complete outer shell and they don't need to bond with anything. Now here's the other thing that you need to remember, and this is especially true in chemistry, more so probably than in physics, is that Mother Nature is a lazy prima donna. So Mother Nature is only going to allow a chemical reaction to happen is if she gains something from it. Okay, that's the only reason any, period, any chemical reaction is going to take place. So nothing reacts with helium, neon, argon, whatever, the noble gases, because Mother Nature doesn't gain anything from it. So if there's nothing to be gained from that reaction, Mother Nature is not going to allow anything to take place. Now, if she gains something from it, then a reaction will take place. So here I've got sodium hydroxide. So you know sodium hydroxide is soluble because of the fact that it exists as a liquid with water. So if I'm going to look at sodium hydroxide, and I, were to, and I would say, okay, hey, Tate, I need you to go into the lab, and I need you to measure me out one mole of sodium hydroxide. So they took the relative atomic masses, and they said, okay, instead of atomic mass units, we're going to put grams on the end of it. Okay, that's all they did. They could have picked pounds. They, said, they could have said one mole was 23 pounds. And when chemists, or when physicists, do chemistry, they usually, instead of 23 grams being one mole, they assign it as 23 kilograms. And then, it's, then that's called a kilomole, because chemists, physics works in the MKS system, which is meters, kilograms, seconds. So if I'm, if I'm giving a lecture in a physics class and we're doing mole conversions, instead of 23 grams, we're going to use 23 kilograms. But in a chemistry class, we're going to let one mole be that relative atomic mass measured in grams. It's completely arbitrary. So if you were to come in here and do this, right? So you got sodium, which is 23. Now, when you're doing work off periodic table, in this class, always 
at least go out to the tenths place when you're writing down relative atomic mass values. Do not round them to the whole numbers. At least go out to the tenths place. Okay? If you really want to get fancy, you can go out to the hundreds. You don't have to go out beyond that. Okay? But at least go to the tenths place. So you got sodium, which is 23.0. You have oxygen, which is 16.0. And you have hydrogen, which is 1.0. So you add those together, you get 0, 40.0. So technically, that's 40.0 grams per mole. Okay, that's what that means. So that's grams per mole. So when you do this conversion from sodium hydroxide, moles of sodium hydroxide into grams, you're going to put the one mole down here, and then you're going to put the 40 grams up here. So now... Here's another thing, especially when you're doing this level of chemistry, don't focus on the product and the answer. Labs, homework, whatever, okay? Now, show me the conversion. I don't need to see 23 plus 16 plus 1. I don't need to see that, okay? I don't need to see that level of detail. But what I do need to see is how you're going to get this answer, okay? So this, I would want to see one mole sodium hydroxide, canceling that out, I get grams of sodium hydroxide. So if I went to Tate and I said, Tate, go get me a mole of sodium hydroxide, he's going to go get me 40 grams, okay? Now, if I take those 40 grams and I dissolve that into a liter of water, that would be a one molar solution. Now, if Tate goes, hey, Mr. Burkamp, I only got 20 grams. Okay. If he only gets me 20 grams, well, that's going to be half a mole. So if I dissolve that into a liter of water, then it would be a half molar solution. So remember, the bigger the number is in terms of molarity, the more concentrated it becomes. Okay? All right. So I got a one molar solution of sodium hydroxide. Put some of this in here. So now I'm going to take a drop of this phenolphthalein. I'm going to add that to it. And notice that that turns like a nice magenta color right away. So any time you have a basic solution, and we're going to use this a lot, okay? Any time you have a basic solution, and if you add phenolphthalein to it, it's going to turn a nice magenta color. Now, and here's the cool part about chemistry, is that why well, don't, I don't know that that was a basic solution. It isn't like I can look at it ahead of time underneath the microscope and go, oh yeah, there's some little hydroxide ions floating around. I can see the little OH with the negative sign on the side. Okay? No. Okay? Yeah. But if I can add this stuff to it and go, oh, right. Oh, it's from Vegeta. It must be it must be a basic solution. And then you go, hmm, now what if I added a little bit of hydrochloric acid to it? So again, let's step back. If I take hydrochloric acid, so do you think hydrochloric acid is soluble or insoluble? Soluble. soluble. Okay, if it wasn't, it'd be a chalk. Okay? Yes, God sakes, it's soluble. Now, hydrochloric acid is one of strong acids. If you want to head start, there's very, very, very few things that I'm going to make you memorize in this class. But one of the things I'm going to absolutely make you memorize, because it's so important, on this sheet, up here in the top left corner, there's a list of seven strong acids. Begin to memorize the names and formulas of those seven strong acids, okay? Now, there's a whole list of weak acids, so there's a lot more weak acids than there are strong acids. But you have to know your strong acids. You have to know them without fail. So here's, like I said, it's very, very seldom that I make you memorize anything. The first thing I want to make you memorize is this list of strong acids in the formulas. As a matter of fact, on the first quiz a week from today, I'm going to make you, not all seven, I'm going, to make, I'm going to make you pick like three or four and write down the names and write down the formulas for them. Okay? Now, if something's a strong acid, all that means is that it completely ionizes in water. So when I take hydrochloric acid and I put that in water, what that means is that that hydronium ion is going to be bound up with the water and the chloride ion 
is going to be bound up and attached to the hydronium end of this. So when you talk about pH, and, and I realize this is all going to kind of full circle eventually. So if you look on your sheet, you have pH equaling the negative log of your hydronium ion concentration. Now sometimes you're going to see it written like this. So this is technically more correct because usually almost all the time when you have hydronium ions it's going to be in an aqueous solution. When you see square brackets like this that means concentration and that's in moles per liter. So anything in a square bracket means concentration moles per liter. So for those of you that might be a little bit rusty on your math and by the way what you will see is that this is basically a math class where I get to play with chemicals that change colors. Okay? This is literally going to be a math class. Okay? We're going to deal with negative logs, graphs, a whole bunch of stuff. So it's like, oh, I'm good at chemistry. That might be true, but if you're not good at math, this class is not for you. Okay? I'm just telling you now, this is basically a math class that we call chemistry. So, if I want to find my pH, negative log of my hydronium ion concentration. Your pH scale generally goes from 1 to 7 to 14. If something is, has a pH of 7, that means that it's neutral. So if you take the negative log, if something's neutral, of 1 times 10 to the negative 7th, if you punch this into your calculator, trust me, you get 7. Okay. So if something's neutral, it has a pH of 7, which means the hydronium ion concentration is 1 times 10 to the negative 7. You'll also see on that sheet that Ka equals your hydronium ion concentration times your hydroxide ion concentration. Excuse me, this is Kw. I'm sorry, that's Kw. Which is called the auto-ionization constant of water. Now, if, there's a whole bunch of things that frustrate me and irritate me, okay? Don't say, oh, water equals hydrogen times hydroxide. This is not water, for the love of God. This is a mathematical value of 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14. So, what this means is if you have neutral water, if, you, if it's neutral, your hydronium ion concentration is 1 times 10 to the minus 7. This is 1 times 10 to the minus 7. If you take the negative log of 1 times 10 to the negative 7, you get a pH of 7. Now, if you have more hydronium ions than you have hydroxide ions, these two numbers multiplied together still equal 1 times 10 to the negative 14. So if you ever know what one number is, you can always find out what the other number is by dividing it by 1 times 10 to the negative 14. So these two numbers multiplied together always equals 1 times 10 to the negative 14. So what that means is if your hydronium ion concentration becomes a bigger number, your hydroxide ion concentration becomes smaller because the two numbers multiplied together always equal 1 times 10 to the negative 14. Now, you'll also see written on there that your pH plus your pOH adds up to 14. Now, P always stands for negative log. So, notice when I had pH, that was the negative log of my hydronium ion concentration. If I have pOH, that's the negative log of my hydroxide ion concentration. So, these two numbers, when you add them, always add up to 14. So, if you know this is why, if you're in a neutral solution, your pH and your pOH are both going to be at 7. Oh, those are going to add up to 14. If your pH is 6, meaning that it's like an acidic solution, that would be 6. Your pH would be 8. Those are going to add up to 14. Okay? So, pH plus pOH always adds up to 14. Hydronium concentration times your hydroxide concentration multiplied together always equals 1 times 10 to the negative 14. And again, don't memorize this. It's on your equation sheet. 
You just have to know how to use it. That's all. So, I've got my sodium hydroxide solution. I added the phenolphthalein to it. And now I'm going to begin to add some, hydro some sodium hydroxide. Excuse me, I've got sodium hydroxide. And I'm going to add some hydrochloric acid to it. So, I'll just put in a couple drops to start with. Okay? Now, you notice that it's still magenta. It means it's still a basic solution. So, let's talk about what's happening here. Sodium hydroxide plus HCl. Now, we're going to do the Chem 1 version of this first. Okay? Anybody remember what type of reaction this is going to be? Single displacement, double displacement? Double. Double displacement, right? So, here's the level that you need to begin to see. This is aqueous sodium hydroxide. So what this means is that this is actually existing as sodium hydroxide and hydrox sodium ions and hydroxide ions. It's soluble. It's in water. Okay. I'm reacting that on an atomic level with hydronium ions and chloride ions because those are also soluble. Okay. Now, if you look at what's going to happen, do you think the sodium is going to try and bond with the hydronium ion. Why not? Well, they're going to have nothing to do with each other. Okay? So there's no way I'm going to make not NaH. Ain't going to happen. Okay? Not new. I'm not going to make ochil. Okay? I'm not going to have my hydroxide bonding with my chloride ion. Okay? Not going to happen. Now, I could potentially reform sodium hydroxide, but what's the point? Because it's just soluble in water. It's like, okay, well, that's cool. All right, cool. Now, but, oh, look, these hydronium ions here could hook up with these hydroxide ions here. Ooh. Now, why are these two going to try and hook up? Oppositely charged. Oh, it's Romeo and Juliet on an atomic level. Oh, well, Romeo and Juliet, okay? Oppositely charged, right? You can explain a lot of chemistry in terms of romance. So these two are going to try and hook up. Now, what do you think the most stable form of a molecule is going to exist when you hook up hydrogen and oxygen? Water. Okay? You don't make hydrogen peroxide. You know why? It's not, it's not stable. So anytime you're going to combine hydrogen and oxygen, you're going to get water. Okay? Now, water bound together, okay, it's soluble, stable, bound, okay. Now, I've still got some sodium ions floating around, and I've still got some chloride ions floating around. So basically, I've made salt water, okay. Now, what's happened is that this solution is still basic. And I know it's still basic because of the fact that it's magenta. So if you look at what's happening, and there's a couple of ways you can represent this. So one option is that you can look at the concentration of your hydroxide ions as the reaction proceeded. So initially, I started with a whole bunch of hydroxide ions, right? Okay. Now, as I add hydrochloric acid to it, what's going to happen to the concentration of those hydroxide ions? It's going to decrease, right? Because they're getting bound up. They're, they still exist within the solution, but now they're not free hydroxide ions. Now they're hooked up with water molecules. So as time goes by, as I add more and more hydrochloric acid to it, the concentration of my hydroxide ions is going to decrease. So if I add some more, okay, I keep going, I keep going, I keep going, all right? Ooh, turn clear. So once it turned clear, now what's happened? What, 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 I, what do I know it's not? I know it's not basic, okay? Because if it was basic, it would still mean magenta. So this is the situation, this is the cool part about chemistry, is that I took sodium hydroxide, which was clear. I took, where is my sodium hydroxide? There's my sodium hydroxide, which is clear. Hydrochloric acid, which is clear. Phenolphthalein, which is clear. I mix three clear solutions together, and depending upon what happens, I can either end up with clear solutions, or 
I can end up back with Now, oh, come on. Let's see, we're close. We're right there on that edge. One more drop. Boink. There we go. So, this is, uh, and in terms of lab safety, this is why you never want to drink anything in a lab. Because I've got phenolphthalein, sodium hydroxide, hydrochloric acid, and water, and they all look the exact same. Okay? So, this is why you never drink anything in a lab. So, here's what happened. So let's do the Chem 1 version of this first. In Chem 1, you would go, oh, sodium hydroxide plus hydrochloric acid. You would get water and sodium chloride. So here's your Chem 1 equation. Okay? Balance. I, <gasps> I did chemistry. Yay! Cool. It's balance. I got one sodium. I got one sodium. I got two hydrogens. I got two hydrogens. I got one oxygen. I got one oxygen. Everything is balanced. Everything is cool. It's groovy, all right? Okay. Now, the net ionic equation, and this is what you're going to spend most of the time dealing with in this level of class, because the net ionic equation only shows you the nuts and bolts of what's actually changing. So, if you remember, like your spectator ions, spectator ions are ions that are on the same on both sides of the equation. So, if you look at my spectator ions here. I got sodium ions here, and there's still sodium ions when I get done. I got chloride ions here, I got chloride ions there. Okay? Those are spectator ions. Because they're they're not changing. Okay, they're just watching the reaction. Now, my hydronium and hydroxide change because they go from free ions into a molecular form of water. So the net ionic equation for this, and you always write the cation first. So got H plus OH yields water. So that's my net ionic equation. Now, when you do net ionics, and this is going to be on this review assignment, net ionics have to balance on two things. They have to balance on number of particles, and they have to balance on charge. Okay? So, if I take 1 plus, plus 1 minus, I get 0 because water has no charge. It's a neutral molecule. Now, let's just say, it isn't, but I'm just going to say, let's just say that it had been uh, calcium. Okay? So if this had been calcium, which would have been 2 plus, I would need 2 hydroxide to balance out that 2 plus. And then I would need two hydroxides so that I would end up with calcium hydroxide over there. I'll show you that in just a second. So, when you do net ionics, always write the cation first, the anion second. This should balance with number of particles and with charge. Okay? Because you just don't put H, because if you just put H, it looks like the element hydrogen. You have to put H plus because it's existing as an ion. Okay, so with that said, now I have water. Okay, and to water, I'm going to add some phenolphthalein. Okay, now what you'll see within water is that there are actually some hydronium ions and some hydroxide ions floating around. Okay, they're not all the molecular form of water. So when you have neutral water, which is what this is. Okay, I actually have some hydronium ions, and I have some hydroxide ions. And that concentration of both of these is 1.0 times 10 to the negative 7. So, the, so it's neutral. I have them, but they're balancing each other out. Okay, and that's a pretty small number. I don't have a lot of hydronium ions, and I don't have a lot of hydroxide ions. But there's some there. I added the phenolphthalein. I know that overall the solution is basic. Excuse me, the solution is not basic because it didn't turn magenta. So now I'm going to add a chunk of calcium. Now, here's what you have to begin to keep in mind. There's a huge difference between taking calcium and adding that to water versus taking like a calcium ion and adding that to water. So one of the things that you're going to have to really start to pay attention to is what form is this in? Because 
if I take like calcium nitrate, okay, CaNO32, okay, because remember all, all nitrates are soluble. So if I take calcium nitrate and add that to water, I would be adding calcium ions. I'm not adding calcium nitrate. I'm adding a chunk of calcium, okay? So I'm just calcium, boom, okay? It's like what's in your bones. So I'm going to take some calcium and this is calcium. I'm going to drop that in there. Now, right away, what's happening? Well, first off, what color change are you getting? Magenta. Magenta. So right away, what am I knowing? What is happening to the solution? It's turning basic. basic. Now, you'll also see that I'm producing some bubbles. Okay? So here's a very simple observation. I took a chunk of calcium. I put that in water. Whatever the reaction is, is producing two things. It's producing hydroxides, which is making it turn magenta, and it's producing a gas, which is producing the bubbles. Okay? So that's what I know is happening. So, could, so let, let's look at some potential gases that I could get out of this. Okay? So, could I get carbon dioxide out of that reaction? No. Why not? There's no carbon. Okay? It's kind of cool. Right? Can't make that. Okay. So that's out. All right. So basically, what are the two potential gases that I could make? I could make hydrogen or oxygen. Those are the two. Those are the only two that I could make. Okay? Hydrogen and oxygen. So in this situation, here's the easiest way to think of water. Think of that as being an H and an OH, okay? So, now, again, this calcium, if you look on the periodic table, okay? Ooh, oh, smoking. By the way, that's a very exothermic reaction. It produces a lot of heat. So, like a strawberry slurry. So, when this is happening, remember calcium is in group two. So for those of you that, again, have need a quick refresher on your periodic table, and you've got to be able to use your periodic table. So, lithium, sodium, potassium, all of those have one valence electron. Okay? The next, next group over your rare earth, okay, Berylium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, all of those have two valence electrons, okay? So, I know when calcium, even, though, even if I can't remember what charge it is, if I can look on the periodic table and see that it's in group two, I know it's going to have a charge of two plus, okay? Now, so this calcium is going to tend to give up its electrons, and again, the only reason that calcium is going to give up its electrons is because it's going to form something that's more stable. So this thing is going to form a charge of 2 plus. So once it forms a charge of 2 plus, is it going to bond with the hydronium or is it going to bond with the hydroxide? The hydroxide, right? So I'm going to get calcium hydroxide and hydrogen gas. Okay? There you go. Now, when I look at this calcium hydroxide, I know some of these hydroxide ions have to be floating around. Because if the hydroxide ions weren't floating around, it wouldn't turn magenta. So, if you look on this page, on these solubility rules, okay? So, if you look on your hydroxides, okay? Hydroxides are generally insoluble. They tend to form pretty solid bonds. So, the hydroxides, barium, strontium, and calcium are moderately soluble, okay? So, what that means is that if I take calcium hydroxide and I dissolve that in water, 
it's not all going to dissolve, but part of it will. Okay, so that's what it means when it's moderately soluble. Now, if you look at your carbonates, okay, so carbonates, chromates, phosphates are generally insoluble. Now, anybody know the common name for calcium carbonate? Chalk. Chalk, also limestone, right? Okay, also limestone. If you ever go up to K-State KU, you'll notice a lot of the buildings are made out of limestone. So, do you think calcium carbonate is soluble or insoluble in water? Okay, think this through. Would you want to build a building out of a soluble compound? No. It would look good until it rained. Okay? Oh, let's build our house out of salt. Okay? Maybe cool if you're in the desert. All right? First big rain, whoop, what happened to the house? I don't know. It dissolved. Okay, it's gone. So calcium carbonate is limestone. Okay? Chalk. And so that is insoluble, right? So you don't have to worry about it dissolving over the period of time. So because it's calcium hydroxide, it's moderately soluble. And I know that because I've got some hydroxide ions floating around. I can't see them. But because it turned a magenta color, I know that something had to happen where I have enough hydroxide ions to turn the solution basically. Okay, y'all been sitting for a while. Stand up, take a stretch, and then we'll continue. Uh, okay. It's going now. Okay. So I forgot to start that back up. For those of you that are watching, we didn't miss much. We're just talking about the fact that if I ever had a son, I'd name him Wolfgang. So on a on a redox reaction. Leo says, go, if you lose electrons, that's oxidation. If you gain electrons, that's reduction. Okay? So if you looked at the electron configuration for calcium, we're going to start off with 1s2. Okay? We're going to put two electrons in there. One has a spin of plus one half, the other one has a spin of minus one half. That's how we keep them separated. So then 1s2, then you're going to go to 2s2, right? So now we're up to four electrons. What comes after the S? What do you fill after the S? P. The P. So then we're going to go 2P. Now, in the P sublevel, how many orbitals can you have in the P sublevel? Three. You can have three orbitals, right? And each one, each orbital can hold how many electrons? Two. Two. So you can put that as like an up spin, minus spin, up spin, okay? So we're going to have six, a maximum of six. Now, this is going to be important when you answer some of the questions on that review. Remember, these electrons don't like each other. So Mother Nature is only going to put one electron in each orbital until they get full. Once they get full, then you put one in each one, then you're going to start to double them up. Okay, so that's what's going to happen until you begin to double them up. So at this point, we're at 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, grand total of 10. So if you look on the periodic table, so remember these numbers up here, the 1, 2, okay, and then like 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, even though they, this one they have them like going up to 18, but this tells you the number of valence electrons. Everything in this column has one valence electron. This has two valence electrons. So the reason the periodic table has two columns here, this is filling the S sublevel. Okay? That's why there's two, co that's why there's two columns, because the S sublevel only holds two electrons. Over here, you're filling the P sublevel. And if you count across, you'll notice that there's six. So there's six columns right there. Okay? So each, so then you can go like. P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, P6. So that's how you, if you want to know how many valence electrons there are, S1, S2, P1, P2, P3. Now, in between, that's where you're going to fill the D block. Okay? So if you go across, like let's say, for example, you want to write this for calcium. 
So it's not on your periodic table, but here's like a handy thing that you can always remember. So there's like hydrogen. So imagine that there's a one out there, there's a two with, there isn't, but imagine that there is. There is on a lot of periodic tables, and then you have sodium, which is three. And then you have potassium, which is four. So these numbers aren't written on this periodic table, but if you put numbers out to the side, that indicates which outer shell electron that you're filling. So this is filling the first sub, this is for that first energy level. Now you're going to start to fill the second one. Then you're going to start to fill the third. Then you're going to start to fill the fourth. So when you get down here to where calcium is, okay, so calcium is down here with 20. So if you count down, you go one, two, three, four. So I know calcium is going to be filling that fourth energy level. So what I've done is that I've gone 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Now I'm going to, let me start over. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. And then I'm going to go 3s2. So that gives me a total of 12. And then I'm going to go 3p6. And then what? 4s2. Okay? And that adds up to 20. So these are the electrons that are going to be lost first because those are the furthest away from the nucleus. They're the ones that are most tightly bound. Now, if you don't want to write all of that out, here's the shortcut you can do. If you go to the row above and find that, knee, that noble gas, which is argon, okay, so here's the shortcut way that you can do calcium when you write the electron configuration. This core right here is argon. Okay, that's, a, that's the argon. That's it. That's your argon core. So the shortcut you can do is put argon and then 4s2. Okay? So if, if, you, if you really like to write these out, you can. But the only thing that you can fill in here are the noble gases. You can't fill in anything else. If you're going to shortcut this, you can only do the noble gas as a core. Okay, or you can write it all out, it doesn't make any difference. Okay, but so like if you want to do like, let's say you wanted to do uh, aluminum, okay, so if you wanted to do aluminum, you'd have a neon core, okay, so that's going to get you 10 electrons. Then you'd come down here to where you have aluminum, you'd count down, oh, so sodium starts the third row across, so that would be 3s2. So that gets me 12, and then I'd go 3P1, okay? So that's one of the things you're going to have to do on that assignment is write those things out. How are the, like the D ones written again? Isn't there something different to do with the... Uh... No, that's just going to be how... There, there are some hinky ones within that on the transition metals mm -hmm. where you go like 5S1, 3D5. Don't worry about that for now, okay? Don't worry. I won't, I won't give you anything weird like that. Okay? Got that. Life's good. Okay. So, basically what happens is this. This calcium went from being, two, being elemental calcium, where it has 20 protons and 20 electrons, and then it's going to lose those two. You have to remember what defines the type of atom is the atomic number, which is the number of protons. It is not the number of electrons, okay? It's what's inside, and this sounds hokey, but it's what's inside that counts, okay? So let's say I'm having a really bad day, and I'm in a car accident, and I, sev I get my left arm severed, okay? It's a bad day, okay? I could man up and still come in and teach class the next day, okay? Like, I can't, what happened to your arm? Don't ask. Okay? Yeah, I might have lost my arm, but I'm still me, okay? Because I've still got that core knowledge. I've got my heart. I've got my soul. I'm still here, okay? Driving home, worse accident, okay? I lose my, my, like, my leg, one of my legs, so I'm like, okay? I'm back the next day, though, okay? Solid, okay? Got to teach, right? Okay? Nurses, you need some... Chips ice. No, I'm good. Okay? Let me take your temperature. No, I'm good. I've lost a leg for God's sake. So, but I'm still me. Okay? And the same thing is true with electrons. You can gain and lose electrons, but it's still, as long as you don't change the number of protons, 
it's still the same element. You can make a cation, you can make it an anion. Remember, do cations gain or lose electrons? Lose electrons. So if something is, re is readily able to lose electrons, that means that it's going to get oxidized. So metals tend to be oxidized. Non-metals tend to be reduced because those tend to gain electrons. So basically what happened when I dumped that piece of sodium or that chunk of calcium in with this water, basically the calcium had its full valence electrons. It came up to the water and said, yo, sup? The hydronium, H+, plus, and if you think about it, that's just a proton. Because if you have a hydrogen atom, that's one proton and one electron. It's a hydrogen atom. If it loses that electron, guess what you have left? A proton. So basically what happened is this. On an atomic level, the proton comes up to the calcium, those two valence electrons, and says, so kind of hang out with me. Now, these electrons were conflicted at this point. They've been with this calcium for a long time. Calcium is formed in like the depth of supernova stars. You don't make calcium easily, okay? We have calcium because stars have gone supernova and that calcium has gotten kicked out into the universe, okay? Calcium's tough to make. So these electrons have been with these calcium atoms for a long time. It's like, dude, we're tight, okay? Remember like four billion years ago we, we, we were in that supernova? Okay? Come on, we're tight. We've been through a lot. We've been sitting in this jar for God's sake, for God knows how long, whatever my jar of calcium is. Okay? There's a jar of calcium floating around here somewhere. You get there it is. Okay? It's like we've been sitting on this shelf together. We're tight. We've shared a lot. And then this proton comes along and says, Sup. And these electrons go, we're out of here. See ya. Gone. So those protons are going to be left over, right? And so the hydroxide, so these two are going to bond together. So this hydronium ion is going to take an electron from this calcium, and it's going to become hydrogen. Now, remember your diatomics, right? Hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, fluorine, bromine. Okay, remember, those are the diatomics. I was called, when I taught Kim one, I was called the diatomic chicks, because, and imagine this will not apply to you because you're the only girl. But like at prom or dances, girls always go to the bathroom by themselves, okay? They have to go in pairs. So that's why I would refer to them as the diatomic chicks. So you can never go to the bathroom because you'd have to go by yourself. So I'm just saying. All right. I grew up with three older sisters. I know these things, okay? So basically what happens is that this hydronium, which is a proton, comes up to these electrons and says, yo, so these electrons go, we're out of here. Okay? And then it forms a hydrogen atom. Then that hydrogen atom goes, oh, I really don't like this. I don't like being alone, right, that I've got a proton. Then it says, oh, we're going to find another one, and then we're going to make hydrogen gas. Okay? So this boiled down to a reaction. The calcium gave up its electrons. You formed hydrogen gas. What was left over was the hydroxide. Now the hydroxide and the calcium are going, calcium's kind of gone, feeling a little bit rejected at this point. It's like, Dude, these two electrons just left. We were tight. But the hydroxide says, hello, sailor. Because the hydroxide has this negative charge, right? And it's going, wow, can we hook up? Wow, yeah, because now the calcium has a charge of 2 plus. So now the, the, the hydrogen, they're, they're off by themselves. They're bubbling up. They're fly me free, okay? We're making hydrogen gas. The calcium hydroxide, they're stuck with each other, okay? But they're sta more stable. But again, Mother Nature only does what's easiest for Mother Nature to do. So we end up with this because of the fact that it's more stable. Now, if I take silver and dump that in water, do you think anything's going to happen? No. This is, why we use, this is why we make silver in jewelry. Silver doesn't react with water. The hydronium, this proton, isn't capable of taking an electron away from the silver because the silver says, we're tight, okay? That electron isn't going anywhere. So if someone offers you like a, a calcium bracelet, don't wear it in the shower. Look what just happened. Bad things are going to happen. This is why we don't use calcium 
in jewelry because it reacts very violently with water. Okay, so I'm done. You all have been a great studio audience. Hopefully, this is you've learned some stuff along the way. Refresh some memories. Tomorrow, I'm going to give the same speech to my to that class, so you don't have to worry. Wednesday, I'm going to make a video going through all this stuff. Look through this. If there's anything specifically that you want me to go over, let me know. Okay? So email me so that you say, hey, Burkamp, I really, you really need to cover this. I know there's a question on weak acids that I'm going to go over on that last section. So don't flip out on that. I know I'm going to do that weak acid question. Okay? I know I'm going to do that one already, so don't. I know that one. Okay. So can you shut that down? Thank you.